Let me welcome everyone. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. I'm delighted to see you all here today. We have a terrific guest and I'm really excited to dive in. Now, I'm delighted to host this week's guest for two major reasons that have to do with the forum's work over the past six years. First of all, uh, this is an extraordinary person who has transformed a university. And so in that, I'm very curious to learn what he has learned about presidential leadership, but also what he's learned about what it takes to change a university, especially now. Um, president uh, Kubain is the president of High Point University, a bit south of here. Um, he has had an extraordinary career and well, let me beam him on stage so we can learn all, all we can about it. Welcome President Kubain. Thank you very much, Brian. It's a pleasure being with you. Well, it's a delight to host you here. I'm really glad you can make time for us. Um, we have a tradition on the forum. When we ask people to introduce themselves, we do so in a particular way. We ask if you could tell us what you're going to be focusing on for the next year. What are the big topics and what are the big projects that are top of mind for you? Well, um, uh, for the next year, we obviously are, are uh, focused on a number of things, but mostly sustainability in, mm -hmm. uh, in a world that is ever changing in a global competitive environment in which all of higher education resides ensuring that affordability is possible for all students, regardless of background, and uh, ensuring that faculty have the resources necessary to deliver an extraordinary education to every student in an inspiring environment and with caring people. And of course, to also acknowledge that economic conditions and geopolitical conditions do affect the work that we all do. And so we are very cognizant uh, of what is going on and very focused on what can happen and very determined and committed to be prepared to deal with those issues. Excellent. Excellent. That's the perfect answer. Thank you. Um, now, friends, if you're new to the forum, uh, I have just a couple of quick questions to ask uh, Dr. Quibain to get the ball rolling. But the forum here is for you. This is the place for you to ask your questions. So please, again, feel free to click the raised hand button if you want to join us. Um, I don't know if any of you are going to be as immaculately dressed as uh, President Quibain, but we will still welcome you uh, on the video. And if you'd like instead, just hit the Q&A box and type in a question. Uh, my first question to ask is, uh, how have you managed to transform High Point so thoroughly? I mean, you've expanded the number of students, you've expanded its endowment, you've added colleges within it, uh, its huge amount of donors have just taken off, and now it's one of the most highly ranked colleges, excuse me, universities in the South. How did you do all this? What's your secret? Well, Brian, thank you for your uh, exaggerated introduction of that question. I appreciate it. Um, let me just be very clear that, that no one person can do um, anything in higher education that is both sustainable and purposeful. Clearly that this is a work of the many and I am just privileged and blessed uh, to be in this leadership position. Let me just set the background for you if I may, because that is important for any answer I can give you. Um, I, I went to High Point University as an undergrad student. So I have an affinity and a commitment and a love for the institution. Number two, I lived in the city of High Point where High Point University is located for the better part now 45 years or more. So I had I had connections across the city. I had led most of the nonprofits in the city from the United Way to the YMCA to economic development and so on. I say all that because it's, it's unfair for me to describe our success without setting some conditions that work for me, that were, that were advantages to me that perhaps may not be advantages or benefits to a new president in a new location at a new institution. So um, when I came here in 2005, I had already put in about 30 plus years in business. So my, my journey to this position is somewhat unusual in the sense that I, uh, uh, I, was, uh, I, I started half a dozen businesses, including a, including a bank way back when. And... Uh, you know, I came to this country as a student, 17-year-old student, um, and um, I'm getting some feedback, but I'm not sure if it's me or somewhere else. Are you hearing it? It sounds good. It sounds good. Oh, okay, good. Um, so anyway, bottom line is um, I was in business, and I was on the board of High Point University, and 
Um, I was the incoming chairman of the board of the trustees. And mm. the university was not doing well. I'm just going to put it in plain English. Um, and some universities today that some of us know are also in the same, in the same situation. Uh, the university was down to 370 freshmen and a declining pattern. It had 91 oh. acres um, landlocked. You couldn't grow residential area. It um, had revenues of under $28 million. It was flat to losing money every year. And it was ranked pretty low on U.S. News and World Report. So mm-hmm. and we had deferred, deferred maintenance of about $120 million. So mm-hmm. the board just sort of, I don't want to say begged me to come, but shall we say heavily persuaded me to come. <laughs> and I thought I'd just be here for a couple of years, fix things and leave, go back to a very successful career. Uh, the story is I fell in love, fell in love with the students, uh, mm. just fine with faculty. Uh, I found a dedicated, stellar faculty and staff willing to move on and make things better. And uh, here I am. This is my 18th year at High Point University. Today, we took the 91 acres, we're at 535 acres. We took the $28 million in revenue, we're at close to 350, 400. We took endowment from a small 35 million to about 150 million, and that's going up. We took net assets from 50 million to about a billion two. But most, wow. importantly, most importantly, we we significantly uh, improved the academic program. So we went from three academic schools to ten, including mm-hmm. dentistry and soon law and pharmacy and so on, uh, from a hundred faculty to almost 400 plus faculty members and um, and you can't run away from this fact you don't have a university if you have no enrollment we went from a class of 370 in the freshman class which gave us a total population of 1500 to today a freshman class that's larger than the total population so we have about hmm. 550 uh, new freshmen every year and about 6,000 people in, in enrollment. Now, I have not answered your question, Brian. I'm sorry, but I had to give you that background. Uh, how does one transform a university? Well, gosh, that's a big word, transform a university. Um, I, let me just say that we've done four things at High Point. Number one, we created appreciated value. Appreciated value is very different than creating value. So you can create all the value in the world, but if the parents don't appreciate it, the students don't appreciate it, the employers don't mm. appreciate it, then you're not really getting the fullness of the impact. So we create appreciate value. We're a God family country school. This is not a political statement. This only suggests that we have fundamental values by which we stand. Uh, we obviously are an inclusive university. We have students that come from 50 countries and 50 states today. They represent every spectrum economically, socially, politically, and spiritually. Uh, And we focused on being the premier life skills university. That is not simply a tagline or an advertising, you know, slogan. It is an ecosystem that is embedded in the very fiber and fabric of this institution at every level, in every way, every day. So parents tested us and believed it. And they start sending these students here uh, uh, in big numbers. We have about 15,000 applications a year for the freshman class. We have about 12,000 families that visit the campus for the tour. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, and so we created appreciated value, number one. Number two, we interpreted that value in a manner that other people can see immediate and instant benefit. Number three, we removed all the irritants. So we don't build students for photocopying and, and, and a ride to the airport and, uh, you know, a concert ticket. All the things that irritate parents. I'm a parent. I have four children, my wife and I. And so we've, we've removed it. And number four, we added wow to the experience. Those are the four things I'm happy to answer, you know, more detail. But those are the four things that we do. We do it consistently every day at every level. And as a result, it has been a, a spectacular success. I'm, that's a great answer. And I appreciate you taking time to, to sketch out the background, the before and after. Uh, I'm, I am curious about the second one. Um, before, you said it was a, a, a life, was a lifestyle or um, 
Premier life skills. Life skills, what does that mean? That means that when you enter the hallways of an institution to learn, uh, you have to have solid academic programs that are backed by solid um, resources, right? So if you want to major in biology, you should have the, the best of laboratories so that you can be prepared academically. So there is no argument about the notion that the foundation is the academic program. You must have the best faculty. You must resource them well. You must you must ensure their happiness to the extent that you can. And we do many things, by the way, in that regard to show respect and so on. And and that's the academic piece. But we're living in a world today that if you graduate from college and you're Phi Beta Kappa and you you are terrific in in your knowledge base and understanding base but you are not prepared for life you go work you go work in a company and that company says i don't really um ah something just happened brian whatever did the, the echo is gone from my end here so um ah, I, I think i took care of it i see what you did yeah so um so you have to have the academic excellence and preparation but you must also be prepared for life if you want to go start a business you should know something about really know something about starting a business. And if you want to go work in a corporation, uh, you, they shouldn't have to spend two years of retraining you on how to start in that corporation. So we have built an ecosystem here where they get the solid academic Six. learning and they equally get a solid, practical, pragmatic application of that learning in life. Whether you you know, want to go to grad school, whether you want to become a doctor or you want to become an entrepreneur, whatever. Sure. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate that. In the uh, in the chat box, uh, Lisa Durf suggested that those were soft skills. And I think this is a particular slice of them. Um, and that's that's very interesting. Well, I, I don't call them soft skills because um, I know they've been called that in the back. I call them life skills. There's a distinction between the two. The, you know, semantics do make a difference. So if you say soft skills, that means they're lesser than. Uh, I call them life skills mm. because they're equal to. Now, life skills without a, a solid preparation of academic excellence is going to be at, at best, you know, uh, false or inaccurate, incomplete. So you have to have the academic yeah. base. But you also, let me put it this way. Academics are like the Mona Lisa. The Mona Lisa is arguably one of the finest arts of all time. It sits in the Louvre, um, and nobody's going to mess with the Mona Lisa. That's the academic piece. The faculty are learned and intelligent, and they can put together the curriculum and deliver it with excellence. However, it, when you see the Mona Lisa of the Louvre, you will find that it is beautifully framed. It is well lit. It's strategically located. Mm -hmm. Those are the things that I call the frame around the Mona Lisa. So what we've done here is we've solidified our academic program, arguably and clearly understanding that this is the base of the foundation, the lifeblood of an institution. But then we took some liberties with the framework around it. We said we can bring in, for example, we have a very solid in-residence program here where we bring in the founders of Apple Computer, Netflix, the CEO of Domino's Pizza, the, 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 the CEO of Mark Cuban's, you know, sports operations, on and on and on to talk, to talk to our students specifically in those areas, maybe media, maybe technology, maybe sports management, so that they can get that value as well. Those are life skills. Those arm you with the knowledge that you need to move forward. But he, he, Brian... Knowledge does not equal understanding. Knowledge does not equal understanding. I spent my life educating people in businesses. That was my business. Consulting firm, coaching firm, writing mm -hmm. books, creating materials, delivering seminars. And, I, and it became very uh, clear to me that just because they took a bunch of notes and just because I really gave a terrific presentation and I had wonderful you know, uh, uh, PowerPoints and so on, it doesn't mean they they truly understood it. So when you understand, you cannot apply something until you fully understand its application. And that's what I mean by life skills. Mm. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you. And uh, as a consultant, I really appreciate that. 
uh, we, we have several questions that are coming in uh, that are spring off of that. So let me just put one of these uh, up on the screen. And this is from John Hollenbeck. It says, there's always been a distrust of business ideas in academia, yet you seem to have transcended that distrust. How do you see your perspective working with and enhancing the practice of academia? That's a very insightful question. It's a, it's a real question. Um, and um, it's, it's not one that I've given a whole lot of thought to, so forgive me if my answer is somewhat um, pedestrian. But the reality of it is that I operate on the three Ps, that every organization, whether it's a university, a corporation, uh, a church, if you want, a uh, nonprofit of some sort, it doesn't matter. Uh, they all have the three Ps. The, P, the three Ps are the product, the process, and the person. Once we acknowledge that humans are humans, wherever they may be, a uh, CEO of a corporation still has the same fears, same needs, same goals, same aspirations, basically, which is happiness, joy, love, appreciation, encouragement, success, etc., as a professor would have on a college campus. I did not come here to say faculty are different than. I came here to understand that the process is different and the product is somewhat different. Mm -hmm. And so I invested my time to focus on understanding the process, process of shared governance, the process of a curric curricular uh, design, the process of enrollment uh, um, uh, expansion, and so on. Um, but but, but the, uh, the person who just asked us this question is right. There is some distrust. And when I came here, uh, there was some questioning about some of the ideas that I had. But here's what happens. If you have a good idea, and if you communicate it in a way that others can acknowledge the truth that lies within it, and if you are authentic, authenticity above charisma any day, if you're authentic and honest in the way you, you, you share it, and if you say to people, listen, this is my idea. I'm not saying it's the right idea. I'm not saying it's the only idea. I'm only saying we've got a challenge here and our school is not doing well. And these are some ideas that are worth trying. I think they can get us somewhere. And, and so let's give it a chance. And fortunately for me, I found that people believed me. And while they did not like everything I said or did, uh, and I'm sure today not everybody agrees with every thought I had, I hope not. It would be a redundant institution uh, uh, um, atmosphere if that's what we did. And so... Um, I, I don't know what to tell you. I, I'm a guy who, who connects with people, builds bridges with people. I am confident. I hope I'm also competent. And I now live on the, the, on the notion that we've done this for 17 years. The proof is in the pudding. There's a reason why 500 institutions of higher learning have chosen to come visit me here to figure out. I get a I get a, an invitation to come here about every two, three days um, that other institutions, critical as they may have been of us the first three, four, five years. And that's okay. When something is new, we all have questions about it. And we all deserve to have inquiry about it. But as we went on, people discovered maybe there's something to what we're doing. And maybe the marketplace is responding to us. Marketplace as in parents and students. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and maybe, Brian, just maybe, we were also somewhat flexible. Maybe I've been able to convince my faculty that agility and flexibility are good qualities. You don't have to give up the heart and soul of who you are and what you do to reach out a little bit, to build a bridge mm. with others. So I think I've been able to persuade people that the sole purpose for an institution is not merely to create knowledge, as good as that sounds, and as pure as that was intended to be early on at the, at the invention of something called the university. But today, in this changing world, we have to acknowledge that students who graduate from school who doesn't get a job is not going to have a successful life. And, and the parents are not going to like it. So maybe there's a marriage between the two. And I've been able to sort of communicate that. And, and, and today we have, we have found that our students can graduate and be prepared for a life filled with success and framed with significance. Uh, framing comes back to the Mona Lisa again. Uh, 
Thank you. Thank you, President Quibain, for that passionate answer. And John, thank you very much for that question. Friends, if you're new to the forum, that's an example of a text question. So you can see that John typed this in, I flashed it on the screen, read it out loud, and our guest devoured it. So if you have more questions, please consider that uh, the Q&A box. And as I say that, another question just popped up. Uh, this is from Lee Nichols. And Lee Nichols asks very simply, what is the wow of the experience at your university? Oh my goodness, Lee, you have to visit us. I, it would take us much longer than, than this hour for me to answer all that. So what is, what is the wow? The wow is a feeling that an individual experiences. For some, the wow is a fabulous library where you can go and devour books and, 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 and get invested in technology and so on. For others, the wow is to be in a, in a Hillel group with your buddies or, or to be in an athletic activity. What I meant by the wow is that we created an environment that is that is very inspiring. So I'll just give you some examples. So the moment you come on our campus, within 30 seconds, you will acknowledge it's a beautiful place. I dare say you will acknowledge because I, mm -hmm. I know that from the thousands who've come here. You will say it's a beautiful place. You will say it's inspiring. Uh, we've created all kinds of wows. You can't walk from your car as a guest to the, for example, the student center without seeing quotes in the ground from all kinds of people, men and women of history. Uh, you'll see sculptures. You know, you can go sit on a bench and talk to William Shakespeare if, if poetry is your passion. You can uh, talk to Madame uh, Curie as well if, if that's your passion. You can talk to Rosa Parks if you want to know about courage. Uh, you can talk to somebody else to talk about, you know, something else. And so wow is both in the visual, that which you actually see and feel, and wow is also in the experience itself. The food you eat, the place you live in, the classroom you study in must be conducive to learning. So I'm all about openness. I'm all about, there's no one classroom on this campus that has one, you know, scratch on a wall or a pain in the ceiling that's falling off. Um, first thing I said to our faculty, if, if you have a desk that's broken or a file cabinet that's messed up or a chair, shame on you. You need to rebel against that. And my job is to go find that for you. And early on, we didn't have the money. So I had to call on all my friends and contacts that I knew and say, would you give me 100 chairs? You know, would you give me 100 file cabinets? Would you give me 100 computers? Would you give me 100 mattresses? But the point is, I wanted every faculty member to live in a good place. Here's why. A happy faculty member becomes a better presenter and a better engager of thoughts. I don't really want teachers in the classroom. What I really encourage here are enablers of learning. Individuals who can, who can um, create within the student this capacity to be engaged, to be fully engaged, to learn, to ask, to dialogue, to debate. Um, and so uh, it's, in the, it's in the visual, the physical, it's also in the feeling that's created within you. I'll just give you one other example. There are hundreds of examples, but I'll just give you one. Um, I noticed that we only had one, one place to eat, by the way, called the cafeteria. And uh, it, was, it was dismal. It was dismal. dismal. I mean, you went in, it, was, it looked sad. There was no creativity, no color, no excitement. Uh, you basically walked in this row, and there were two persons behind the table there. They poured the food for you, and you can almost see they don't like their job, and you can almost hear them murmuring under their nose, you know, eat, die, eat, die. <laughs> you know, there was no excitement about what they're doing. And so... I said, this place ought to be a happy place. Let's bring the food out. Let's make more stations. Let's make it more what they want to eat. Let's put some mirrors and let's put some music. So from 11 o'clock to two o'clock every day, we have an actually a live band. Sometimes your students, sometimes it's others every day in the cafeteria. Now, we did that for a reason. The, the wow is not about some silly, cosmetic, superficial, unnecessary add-on. The wow has to be authentic, meaningful, touches on the senses, meets the needs of those individuals. Of course, in a responsible and meaningful way. We're not trying to 
pamper our students. We're trying to prepare our students. So I noticed that students were coming in the cafeteria within eight minutes, grabbing up their food, swallowing it, and leaving. And I said, a university shouldn't be like that. We should create places where the zone is inviting for dialogue, for fellowship, for discussion. And so by putting the music in, simple as that, and by making the place better, we create a wow environment. Today, our students go there, spend 30 minutes, 40 minutes. So like a Starbucks, you know, they, they get their computer, they study, they get up there, get some food, come back, go over there, get another thing, come back, and it works beautifully. And we did it in many, many, many ways. I'm just giving you very um, simple examples. What it is is not as important why it is. The why is to create within each individual those feelings that can create within them a desire for transformation, a desire to explore innovation, a desire to be engaged and involved in the life of the university. And with young people today, there are many answers to that question. They come from different backgrounds, different needs, and sometimes different challenges. And we try to make sure that that is met in every way. One other wow I can just say to you about parents. So we have a concierge service here, like a help desk, uh, that's available 24 hours a day. So any parent can send an email or call with any question at any time. Whether it's about safety, about food, about registration, about uh, you know when do I leave the dorm, when do I come back, and so on. That simple thing that we did created enormous goodwill with parents everywhere. Hmm. We were able to take away hmm. the fear of that mom, the fear of that dad, and say, no, no, we're here for you. We, we know what's going on, and we want to be an open book, transparent, answer your questions. As I said, there are hundreds of these. Now, many of those, Brian, came, obviously, from my experience um, in business. And remember, I was consultant to many, uh -huh. many organizations. So... Um, I applied them to university and they worked brilliantly. And for faculty, we created a faculty club, free food every day. Uh, we have a place at the beach, for example, where a faculty member can take their family at the beach in North Carolina, free of charge. Um, we give every we give every faculty member money on their passport so they can eat free on campus. Uh, we give them all the clothing they want, high pre-university every year. We supply them with a technology gift every year, iPad, iPhone you know, whatever, whatever the, the newest <laughs> um, technology might be. Faculty must be respected and staff must be respected. And when faculty and staff are valued and respected, it completely creates an atmosphere in which students feel that, parents feel that. Then I don't have to tell staff, be nice to visitors. It just becomes a matter of, um, you know, second um, second part of your nature. It's part of your nature to, 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 to do that because when you're happy, you know, your world changes. Indeed. Indeed. Uh, well, first of all, uh, Lee, thank you for that very precise question. And, and President Cobain, that's a very passionate and engaging answer. In, in the chat box, I think you've uh, won a bunch of converts who would like to live there. Um, <laughs> Roxanne Riskin has a, a great phrase. Uh, she says that this is... Um, what you've created is a learning environment that is invitational. Oh, I like that. I like. Um, I'm going to write this down. May I use now. that term? That is invitational. I've, I've well, never I'll... thought of it that way. Very nice. Uh, Roxanne, in the chat box, let me know if uh, if that's good by you. But I got to say, that sounds really good. Uh, and uh, friends, I have a couple. And, and she says, yes, please go ahead. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, I have I have a couple of quick uh, clarification questions um, to ask, but um, but we have more questions coming up from the audience, which is what's most important. Uh, Kiel Dumsch uh, asked earlier, I, I can't show this on the screen. He, he, just, he just sent this to me. He said, why did you feel it was important to increase the number of students when at the same time, total enrollment across the US has been declining? So what, what's the motivation for growing the number of high point students? Yeah, that's a really, really good question. Um, the business person in me can give you a business answer, uh, but, there, but there's more than a business answer. So any organization must have a critical mass to be sure that it has the necessary resources to administer it in a sustainable fashion, in a successful manner. And so uh -huh. when we had 1,400 students, we just didn't have the financial resources to do everything, right? It was impossible. 
Uh, here's one example. We're a Division I athletic institution. Now, we had about 250 or so athletes, 1,400, 1,450 students. That means that 1,200 students had to support those 200 athletes, right? Because many of them get scholarships. Mm -hmm. Basketball gets full scholarships. So, um, so if you look at that from an allocational perspective, the cost per capita for athletics was great, was, was too big, was too high. Now that we have 6,000 students, the per capita allocation for athletics is significantly smaller. It's much more bearable. Um, I'll give you many, many examples. Um, if you have more students, now, now I want to make sure everybody understands me. More quantity is not always the answer. Bigger is not necessarily better. I'm not making that argument at all. The argument I'm making is that I brought a perspective that said, let's make this institution as holistically valuable as possible to as many people as possible. And so how do you do that? You had to have more academic offerings, which meant more buildings, more faculty, more laboratories, more resources, more technology. How do you do that? You have to have more money, more resources to enable that to happen. If you want to treat your faculty, as I just said, with the faculty club and food and so on, you have to have, to have resources for that. You, we, are, we are a private institution. We, we, we are not getting any federal money or any state money unless it goes to the student, you know, like a Pell, for example, uh, of the students themselves. And so larger, carefully, thoughtfully, um, is better for us because we have to have that, that, that base, if you will, of financial resources. But, but larger is also more important in other ways. When you have 6,000 students, you have undergrad and grad. You bring a different fiber and fabric to the institution. You know, when you have 6,000 students, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that's the right number, but larger than what we had, you create more talent. You have more students, who have significantly more talent. So we have more musical groups. We went from one musical group to 16. I love that. I happen to love music and the arts and so on. Um, more artistic students. You know, you have more parents. Think about that. You have more parents now. We're able to give you more internships, create more career opportunities for graduates. Mm -hmm. So the, the you know, it's like going to a cafeteria. You know, it's, if, if you can have just chicken and rice and salad, versus have 12 different kinds of things you can choose from. You, you have to begin to appeal to more people. Again, the most important thing to me is not bigger, is not wow, it's not, you know, whether we, we, we um, you know, have more buildings or not, although we built 108 buildings since I've been here. 108 buildings. Ah. We've invested in this wow. university more than $2.5 billion. We raise a lot of money from parents and others. Um, and, but we're, we're, let me put it this way. We're selectively extravagant. When you see our campus, you would understand, but we're prudently frugal. So I want to be selectively extravagant when I come to building, let's say a, uh, uh, a dental school, it's gotta be the best. It's gotta be really great. And I'm willing to be extravagant with that, but I want to be prudently frugal about fixed costs that comes up every day that may not be necessary. Maybe we shouldn't prioritize that. So one has to make that balancing act. So for me, it's about intentional congruence. How do you get all the pieces of your university, the people and academic programs, the academic programs and the social program, everything about it in an intentionally congruent way so that the result, the outcome uh, is meaningful and lasting in the lives of these graduates and meaningful and purposeful for the, in the lives of those who choose to deliver the services uh, academically and otherwise. We have 2,000 employees here and they're all, you know, doing their best every day. Now, now, Brian, let me just throw one other piece of information here. We did what we did in the smack of the Great Recession. So I came here in 2005. By 2008, 2009, this world was uh, falling apart. And I said, um, we're going to continue to build. In times that there may be a recession, we're not going to participate. Uh, and we kept on building. The prices were significantly better. We kept doing it. 
I want to illustrate something to you. Yeah. In my life, I have faith and I have courage. Neither one alone is enough. We have to have faithful courage. Faithful courage that is embedded on preparation and on hopefully wisdom. You know, you have, we talk about AI, artificial intelligence. Well, I, let me tell you something, my friend. There's no such thing as artificial wisdom. So we really still need the human touch to, to, to interact and intercept sometimes some of these ideas that may or may not work. So we, we are much more pragmatic and, and um, the size works for us. Now, to be clear, we're not trying to be 10,000. We're not trying to be 20,000. We think we're in a very sweet spot. We have 5,000 undergrads, 1,000 grads. We'd like the, the grad numbers to go to 2,000 or 2,500. Uh, the undergrad is pretty much where we want them to be. Well, first of all, first of all, uh, Kiel, what, as usual, Kiel, what a great question. And uh, Dr. Kobain, that's, uh, that's a very, very rich answer that hits a, a whole bunch of different aspects. And we have a, a bunch of different uh, comments and questions coming up from this. Uh, Greg Shukman says, selectively extravagant is now my new favorite descriptor. That's a, <laughs> no, no, that's no, a no. very, very good no, one. I got to agree. Uh, we have a question from Joseph. And let me. Brian, selectively extravagant and prudently frugal. One without the other is not enough. Prudently frugal. Greg, make a note. This is important. This is very important. Um, uh, we have a question here about, uh, about faculty. Joseph wants to know, what was the ratio of tenure track faculty to non-tenure track at your time of arrival compared to now? I, you know, have you grown or shrunk uh, tenure track lines? Yeah, well, um, that's a sensitive subject, clearly. And um, I will answer it as honestly as I can. Um, we, we have today about 32% uh, who are tenured, about 47, 48% tenured and tenure track. So that would put us at about half. Uh, let's see, when I came here, we only had 100 faculty members. And I think it was about the same, about a half. Um, so we, we have tenure. We're not trying any way to mess with tenure. Uh, we are careful, however, not to be, how shall I term this, over-tenured, because think of what tenure is. Uh, sure, it's about academic freedom, and we respect that and revere that, but, but also tenure is about uh, a promise of employment shy of something, you know, really bad happening. Mm -hmm. And um, by faculty... Uh, handbook, we, we know what our policies are here, which is you're not going to, you don't discard people, you invite people, you, you make them a part of your family. Um, and so when you tenure an individual, you're making a promise for employment of the long term. You have to think of that from, from a financial perspective, from an accounting perspective, as a liability. If you understand assets and liabilities, because a promise is a liability, it's a promise of future pay. Um, now, I do, I do know the implications and I do know the exceptions and, you know, so don't think that I'm not informed about it. I am. However, I'm making a bigger point. If, if all of your faculty are tenured, for example, then you have tremendous obligations. And if you have all these obligations, you better back it up. Leadership is about delivering honestly and thoughtfully uh, a, a way to create capacity in others, right? What does a, a leader do? He or she creates capacity in others and allocates resources. And one of the elements of allocating resources is to ensure you have enough money to operate forever. That's, that's my job, to leave this university strong and sustainable. And I tell faculty, look, I give you much higher uh, raises if you want every year, but a pandemic hits, a great recession hits, I got to ask you to lower your salaries by 10, 15, 20, 25 percent. I've never done that. In my in my 18 years, we've always raised uh, people's salaries here. We've always given bonuses every Thanksgiving. Um, on my fifth year, we offered three or four million dollars in bonuses. On my 10th year, we did the same thing. On my 15th year, we did the same thing. And then the pandemic came and we just didn't lay off people. And we didn't put them on fair law. And we didn't panic. In fact, our institution stayed open. 
and we we rented eight hotels and I hired nurses and doctors and bus drivers and I said I want to illustrate safely and responsibly not irresponsibly we know it's a pandemic um, a, a way of saying I think we can still live and live safely now we had some of course we had some COVID-19 um, students but we took good care of them obviously if someone had a uh, you know a unique condition of, of being pregnant or have some we made exceptions to the rule for faculty and staff were needed but but um, we respect tenure and not everybody gets tenure just because you're on the tenure tenure track does not mean there's automatic and every year there's somebody disappointed now one thing I did do however I learned that if you are on the tenure track you come up for tenure you've done all the things you have to do and some other committee does not re recommend you and then you have one year you know of employment then you have you must depart and i didn't understand where the fairness and justice was in that so i eliminated that you know i said w i don't understand why we'd have to ask you to leave just because you didn't get tenure and so we're establishing you know contracts where we say no you're a good you're a good you're a good enabler of learning we are a wonderful member of the family we want you to stay here just because you didn't get tenure doesn't mean we don't love you and respect you and and we're giving them you know longer contracts so that's an exception we made that that sort of employed a business concept we said if a person agrees to come and work with you the least you owe them is some degree of of security and um and and that's something that we're also committed to well, thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate your candor and uh, directness in answering the question. And uh, Joseph, thank you very much for, uh, uh, for the very important question. Uh, friends, we have about 10 minutes left, and I want to make sure that we get all of your questions uh, in uh, as they come up. Um, and uh, let me put together a few questions that seem to be hitting the same topic at once. Uh, Kiel has asked this. I think Lisa asked this. And I'll, I'll just flash this on the screen. Um, it's a question of being online. Many universities are growing by adding online graduate programs. It seems like you're enhancing residential undergrad and residential graduate programs. Is there a reason for that strategy? Yes, there is. And the reason is that every study I've ever seen and, and analyzed tells us that a residential educational experience uh, has many, many advantages, both social and educational that students, uh, well, you know, uh, Dr. Maslow taught us this years ago, belonging is one of the primary needs we all have. So being in a residential environment, being engaged in the societal being of this institution um, does something to you as a human being. Um, I can't empirically give you every detail and prove it to you without question, but that is what I believe based on I believe some sufficient level of study um, regarding online programming. We don't have it at High Point, but there are some exceptions. We have an MBA that you can get, you know, as executive MBA. The reasons for that, I don't need to explain it to this well-learned audience. Uh, as as things change in the world, you know, you have to adapt some things. We've adapted that because some people are working full time on an MBA, and we did that. We have a doctor of medical science that's also an online program because these are these are people already engaged in some some um, uh, professional endeavor and they want to get a doctorate in in that field. But ninety eight percent of our programs are all residential and all in person. I'm personally committed to that. I believe that our faculty uh, members are committed to that. Uh, I also believe that there is a significant segment of Americana that wants that. We are, we are that school. Now, when you have a residential experience, it must be holistic. That's expensive. You know, it's, it's, it's not just the academic facilities. Now you've got them 24-7. Our campus is not a suitcase campus. So if you come here on the weekend, parking lots are still packed. Uh, we have created, if you will, a city within a city although we have a very close relationship town gown and we, we encourage our students to go over city and their passport, high point passport can be used at about 300 businesses in our city, including a hospital and, you know, Walgreens and all of that. Uh, but, but we're coming to residential and that's our intent uh, to, to remain on that track. 
Well, thank you. Thank you. That's, uh, that's a very, very interesting take. And that seemed, in some ways it seems retro, uh, but definitely it seems uh, successful. Uh, speaking of success, uh, our good friend Joey King asks, how does HPU measure success? It sounds like it is just more than objective data. Yes, I, uh, I'm very clear on that. Uh, Joey, I think you said, I'm very clear on that. Um, you see, um, it depends who you ask. Success means different things to different people. If you ask an entrepreneur, he might tell you success is making a lot of money. Uh, if you could have asked Ted Turner, he might have said success is uh, creating a media empire like CNN. If you ask, if you could have asked Albert Einstein, I suspect he would have said it's it's uh, unraveling the secrets of the universe. If you ask, um, you know, uh, B Babe Ruth, he might give you completely the financer. If you could have asked Mother Teresa, I think she would have said success is is feeding the hungry in the back alleys of Calcutta. It might be clothing the poor in the back alleys of every town of every continent in our in our world. Um, so success for me is equal to the American dream. The American dream has nothing to do with money and houses and, and big cars. It has to do with the achievement of your own goals. That's success, the achievement of your own goals. If success could be measured or if the American dream could be measured by fans, fame, and fortune, then explain to me what you would say to a person who goes to college gets a degree, meets all the re prerequisites, all requirements, but they want to be a teacher. They want to teach first grade or third grade, and they know they're going to be overworked and underpaid. They know that, but that's what they want to do. Who among us would dare to judge that as not being successful? So to me, success is the achievement of your own goals. If you want to be a, a rabbi or you want to be a bus driver, or you want to be a university president, or you want to be the CEO of the largest corporation, if that's what your goals are, God bless you. My job is to support you and 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 coach you to achieve that. Now, I don't mean that in a silly way. Of course not. If, if you have goals that are damaging to your health or your future, part of our responsibility is to be is to be parentally responsible and to guide you in proper direction. So for hyper university success, maybe that was the question, too, for hyper university success, mm -hmm is not about rankings. The only ranking that makes a difference to me is what happens in the life of every student. I tell parents, you know, if we had all the rankings in the world, if we were the best in all of the world and, and your child comes here and fails, even though we admitted your child, so we, we said publicly, we believe your child can succeed here. And we, somehow we didn't support him or somehow he or she didn't do the work, et cetera. And they fail then that ranking didn't make a bit of difference in your household. And that's my way of saying that we ought to be focused not on populations, not on students, plural, but on the student. That's why we have a success coach, Brian, here assigned to every student on this campus. So we, we assign the success coach 120 days before you enroll. They stay with you. They guide you both academically, socially, obviously they need to. Um, access faculty for academic guidance, but they, they guide you and, and they basically say to you, look, we believe you can succeed. Now you got to do your work. You got to go to class. You got to do your homework. You got to pass your exams, but we're here to ensure that your future is exactly what you want it to be. Hopefully better than your past, better than your present. Mm, uh, well, that's a, that's a great answer. And uh, Joey, thank you for that uh, very concise question, which really, um, really reveals a lot. There's a, a follow-up question, um, uh, President Kube in the camp from that. Uh, Kiel Domsch wants to ask about, uh, as a result, student debt. I mean, it sounds like, you know, this sounds expensive, you know, hiring uh, uh, all these different faculty and staff, including a coach, uh, and then refurbishing this, uh, this, this campus into a gorgeous thing. Um, it, what, what does that do to the debt that students hold? That's a great question. And the question that, that uh, touches on our responsibility as leaders and our responsibility as coaches uh, in the widest uh, definition of what a coach is, is to guide people, to show them the potholes, uh, to, to steer them around them. Uh, I am not a person who is in favor of, of debt, student debt. Having said that, 
I think if you want to come to our school and become a dentist, it's okay. It's okay if you're going to walk out with $100,000 worth of debt because you're going to make that very quickly and you're going to be able to pay that back. That does not apply to every student. So here we, we, we have our financial planning office. We don't call it financial aid. We call it financial planning. Uh, we guide our students. Mm. And if someone says, I love High Point University and I want to borrow every last penny, we say, we don't think that's the smartest thing to do. We don't. You know, uh, let's even get you some scholarship. Let's see. And maybe this is not the school for you. There are lots of other good schools. Uh, that you can, maybe community college is a good start for you. We say it with love and respect. Uh, so our student debt at High Point is pretty much equal. It actually, it's a little less than national average per student. It's about $27,000 per student. That's less than... You see different numbers, but the numbers I see are about 31, 32. Um, that's a bearable debt. It's not a, it's not something that you can't deal with in life. But wouldn't it be wonderful if there was no debt? I do think government has a responsibility. I mean, we can't do it all by ourselves. Affordability is a major issue. Um, everybody who wants to go to college should be able to go to college and, and you know, prepare for a better life that lies ahead, that makes the world a better place. And we institutionally have to help them. At Hype University this year, we gave $73 million in, in institutional funding, um, you know, what you call discount rate, if you will. And, uh, but it's not enough. Every day, my, my heart breaks when I hear from someone who says, I can't, I want to come to your school. Or I want to come back mm -hmm. next year. I just can't because that is a very damaging thing to, to our soul um, because none of us want to see somebody else. Hurt. And believe me, I go... I go the second and third mile personally to try to help every student I can. I, I see my work as a work of stewardship. I'm not, I'm not enamored by the, the majesty of presidential importance, if you will. I see myself as a servant leader who is here to guide and lead and help um, our students, our faculty, our staff. And, and I believe in my own life I've been blessed uh, because of that, both both psychologically, if you will, emotionally, if you will, but certainly spiritually, giving meaning to my life. What does it mean? Who am I influencing? How am I creating an impact in the life of another person? And therefore, Brian, I will tell you this, I love what I do and I work very hard. You're looking at a guy who works about 14 hours every day, but it's not work, my friend. It is, it is a pursuit of happiness if ever I discovered one. That's what uh, our mutual friend uh, Joy Stoya uh, said when she described you, um, and uh, I can I can definitely see that. Um, however, I fear that we're almost out of time, uh, which gives me the chance to ask one last question for you, which is, uh, if if American higher ed uh, learns from the high point example, uh, colleges and universities across the country decide that this is the secret. We know how to do this. What happens to higher education? And what does it what does it look like? Um, is well, it just a lot happier? Is yeah. it uh, is it bigger? Uh, I don't know. Brian, I don't know the answer to that question because you know what? It's, it's as you will know, it's a hypothetical question. That's not going to happen. Number one, number two, um, there are so many forms to arrive at success in higher education. I would never, in a million years, submit to you that our way is the way. Our ways seem to work for Hypo University, given, given my experience, given where Hypo University was and where Hypo University had to go to sustain itself. I am not suggesting this is the blueprint for everyone. However, there are a few things that if applied by all could add measurable benefit to all of us. Um, for example, focus is more important than intelligence. What are we focused on as an institution? Question to ponder. You know, if all we're focused on is um, research, for example, mm -hmm. valuable and valued mm -hmm. as it is, then we might ignore some other things that, you know, freshmen ought to be getting, right? Um, set number two, um, sure. sustainability won't happen if you're fiscally, um, you know, in bad shape. It's not going to happen. And if you're fiscally in bad shape, you have to ask yourself a question. Do we shut down and be done with it? Or do we do things so we can become more fiscally, um, you know, successful? And that question alone leads you, unless you're an Ivy League school, 
with 100,000 applications, you know, to take 2,000 students, unless you're in that bucket, you have to say, what are the things I must do to compete in a marketplace? Competition is not always against another school. Competition is also against no school. Competition is also against, you know, a, a life that is not as fulfilling and so on. So that's the questions we asked here. What must we do so we can be a vital and vibrant institution and in the process be a valuable one to students, not only today, but hopefully for generations to come. So I would not, never submit that we know the way. Uh, we've done some pretty good things and we have many things we are yet to learn. And that's what makes life so joyful and, and so appreciated. Well, what's appreciated is us, uh, us appreciating you for your fantastic hour that you spent with us. Uh, I really admire your your passion, uh, your uh, ability to share a lot of information in a hurry, and uh, also how uh, seriously and deeply you took every one of our questions. Thank you, thank you so much. What what's the best way to keep up with you and to see where High Point goes next? The uh, High Point main webpage. Yes, High Point High Point University is located in High Point, North Carolina. You're welcome to come visit. Um, my personal email, and I answer every email myself. We don't have president at High Point. And so 300 emails a day. It's N Kubain, Q U B E I N, N Q U B E I N, um, at highpoint.edu. Obviously, highpoint.edu uh, is our website. Glad to hear from any of you. Glad to answer any other questions. We had no time to uh, to deal with. But Brian, thank you for inviting me to be with you. And may I express my appreciation to all those who joined us today. And I hope that in some some small way, I was of some usefulness. You definitely were. Thank you so much. Congratulations on this achievement. And we'll be in touch. Take care. Thank you, sir. But don't leave friends. Let me just point out where things are going next. Um, and thank you again for all of your questions. If you'd like to keep talking about this, we've already had some conversation on Twitter about where, uh, about, about this high point model. Just use the hashtag FTTE or tweet at me, Brian Alexander, or at Chindig Events, or hit me up at the, uh, at the blog at brianalexander.org. Um, if you'd like to look into this recording, which should be up in a day, or if you'd like to look into all of our recordings, including our interviews with other presidents, just go to tinyurl.com slash FTF archive. Uh, if you'd like to look ahead to our next sessions, we have sessions coming up on equity, the climate crisis, Web3, digital forward design, and public higher education. Just go to forum.futureofeducation.us for more. And remember, please, like I did earlier before of Noah Geisel, if you'd like to share with me anything that you'd like to pro about that you like a fellow about just email me and i'd be glad to share it because i'm very proud of this community and speaking of this community thank you again for being with us for learning about high point university for all of your questions all of your thoughts your good sense of humor it's always always a pleasure to think together with all of you please take care in this uh, extremely strange spring be safe and above all we'll see you next week see you online bye bye